Welcome back to Team Focus USA. My name is Aaron Days. Today's guest that we have is Clark Kellogg, former NBA basketball player for the Indiana Pacers, voice of 2K, for those of my guys who, who play a little basketball. Some of you may even be familiar with him in his years of commentating during the NCAA men's basketball tournaments. Now this is a big deal. So I hope you guys really enjoy what we're about to get into. Sit back, relax, and enjoy these stories. And take some notes if you want to. Mr. Kellogg, could you tell us what your parents stressed to you uh, while you were growing up as a kid? Yeah, you know, I'm the oldest of five. I've got a younger brother and three younger sisters. My dad was a policeman for over 40 years. My mom was pretty much what I call a domestic engineer. She was a stay-at-home mom until I was probably a freshman in high school. And then she started working as a clerical assistant at a local hospital. But uh, the things that really resonate with me as I think about my parents, both are deceased now, but we had a loving home. I mean, our home was a gathering spot for my aunts and uncles and grandparents. It was a place where family gatherings around the holidays took place a lot. And my folks always emphasized treating people the way we wanted to be treated, um, trying to do the right thing in every circumstance. And then when you committed to something, giving it your best effort, do the best you could in school, whatever that level was for you, you needed to try to get to that. If you were capable of A's, then you shouldn't be settling for B's and C's. If you were only capable of B's and C's, then that's what we wanted to see from you. So they gave us a great foundation of love and care. It wasn't perfect, but I take away from them how you treat people, how you carry yourself and trying to do the best you can in whatever um, you're given to do. And I've tried to embrace that throughout my journey. So you grew up where in Ohio? Um, East Cleveland, small suburb. Yeah, it was a small, it was a lower middle income class suburb. I tell people all the time that we had everything we needed and a few of the things that we wanted. And for me, what I wanted most was the latest pair of fresh sneakers mm -hmm. and a basketball that would last. I mean, I was pretty low maintenance in that regard. Every now and then I might want some desert boots or a certain type of um, snowshoe for the winters when they got rough and maybe a certain type of jeans. But by and large, my greatest desires were to have um, a good pair of tennis shoes and, and a basketball that would function. And if I had that and the freedom and opportunity to go play, then I, I was good. You fell in love with basketball at the age of 10. Yeah. Why? Man, my dad was an athlete. My dad played basketball. He threw the shot put in track. He played football. He actually played some minor league pro football um, in the day before I was able to recognize what he was doing. I was a young buck when he was traveling to Canton in Philadelphia to play for the teams he played with. But um, he was an athlete, enjoyed sports, excelled in them. As I got older and started to play, I heard about his exploits. He went to, he was from Cleveland, went to a high school in Cleveland and had a great reputation. And so um, he exposed all of us to sports. And I was always a little taller than most kids my age. I was kind of gangly and um, bas gravitated to basketball early. And uh, love and basketball grabbed me, man. It was, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the documentary Love and Basketball that ESPN did. It was a 30 for 30 and it just talked about the love affair so many in the game have had and when that happened and it resonated powerfully with me because uh, I couldn't sleep at night when I knew the next day I was headed to the Y to see if me and my boys could rule the court. I'd be so excited about um, spending that time. I'd be thinking about playing, trying new moves, love talking about hoops with my dad. He would tell me about some of the great players from the Cleveland area that he had played against. And then I got to meet some of those guys as I was navigating. So um, I don't know why um, the exposure was part of it. Um, and then I had some early success. You know, I was always decent. I wasn't great, but I always kind of could hold my own even when I first started playing. And, you know, when you do something pretty good, it gives you confidence and makes you feel good. And you kind of want to keep replicating that feeling. So that's kind of how it started for me. I'm glad it grabbed me the way it did. I, I like the word you used, the love affair with basketball. Yeah, yeah. That's, no, that's man. Deep. No, I'm telling you, man. It was, um, I mean, I, I slept it. I drank it. I thought about it. I read about it. Um, and it's something to have, it's, something to, it's neat to have something that positive 
captivates you early. And I know it's other, there, it could be other things. It could be science or, or re, I mean, it could be any number of things. That, but when you find it, it's, um, it's special as long as it's positive. And for me, it was, it was hoops. And from hoops, it really kind of kept me in line in other areas because I so wanted to play. My folks tied the privilege of playing to keeping, in me, keeping me in line in conduct and academics and so forth. So um, it really was kind of the, it was kind of the anchor for me. That, dr- yeah. that driving yeah. force. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we know your dad inspired you and yeah. got you into it, but was there like a particular athlete that you kept your eye on? Yeah, the first guy that I would say I idolized as, an, as a basketball player was Lou Alcindor. He's known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar now. I wore 33 as my number through high school and college because that's the number he wore. And I wore it through the pros too. I was number 33. Um, as I learned about Kareem, loved his grace and accomplishment on the court. And then I started reading about him and his activism, his intellect. Um, his dad was also a policeman in Cleveland. So that kind of, a policeman in New York where he grew up. So I, that kind of resonated with me as I started to just, but he was, he was my guy. I mean, my kids would tell you that when it comes to talking about the GOAT, there's only one guy for me and it's Kareem. I love LeBron, I love MJ, but if you make me pick one guy that I got to ride and die with, it's Kareem. And they know it, all my kids will tell you, when we have these debates about your guy, that was my, that's my guy. Yeah, yeah, that's my guy. You picked Ohio State. Yeah. Who were your coaches? What did they teach you? Yeah, Elder Miller was the head coach there. Chuck Mayshock has recently passed away just a year ago, um, was the assistant. He was primarily involved in my recruitment. Um, Jerry Sears, Todd Landrum were the other assistants. But um, being an Ohio kid, most of the players when I was being recruited were from Ohio. Herb Williams, Calvin Ramsey, Jim Smith, Carter Scott, Todd Penn, guys, Granville Waiters, guys that I played with. And they had a spot that looked like was made for me based on my position and skill set. And the Buckeye Nation put a full court press on me too. I mean, the alumni base of Ohio State is one of the strongest and largest in the country. And most of those folks, probably 50 or 60 percent of them are here in Ohio. And... um, they uh, they put the full court heat on me to being an Ohio kid. They sold me on the value of getting an Ohio State education and being part of the um, Buckeye family. And um, that that was probably the deciding factor, who I was going to play with, who I was going to play for, where I was going to play, um, proximity to Cleveland so my dad could get. He did not miss a home game the three years that I was here. It was an easy drive, and he had flexibility with his work schedule, and he would roll with a partner, and they sometimes spend the night. Other times they roll down and back, and he did not miss one of my home games during my um, three years here. But the nation recruited me. I mean, I got letters. I've still got them boxed up somewhere around here from folks that um, wanted me to come to Ohio State. It was really one of the best decisions I made. I uh, made home my home here it's for the last 25, almost 30 years. So it's a special place, and um, I'm glad to be part of the Buckeye family. But it was that, the players, coaches, proximity to home, quality of the conference I was going to play in. And even though I was only 17, 18 at the time, I was thinking about, to the degree that I could, I had a really good mentor who was an Ohio State grad. I worked for him during the summers, and he talked about the value of being an Ohio State grad and what that might mean to my life. And I've seen that come to fruition in multiple ways that I couldn't really see, but I bought the Kool-Aid he was selling and I'm glad I did. I like the way you said that it was a big part of your life. Yeah. Uh, You know, um, sometimes you just don't, you know, it looks like to me that the stars align for you perfectly. Man, I, I, I credit it to the grace of God. Quite honestly, I mean, at the time I wasn't a Christ follower, but I have been since 86. And I now see where God's hand was on my journey. And I don't quite fully understand it. I've had unbelievable favor. Clearly, my parents and family were great supporters and gave me a good foundation. Um, I've had terrific coaches and a lot of great people come alongside me. I'm trying to do my part, but I really attribute it to the grace and goodness of God to move me forward. And basketball was a big vehicle in getting me started on a path to, to a life that's been um, fulfilling and, um, and reasonably successful. Yeah. A man in his gift. Oh, wow, that's a great way to put it, yeah. And um, I was gifted because the aptitude I had for the game early on always had me a little bit ahead of kids my age. And there's a giftedness that allows you to be a pro. That's not something that 
people are able to just make themselves into, whether it's basketball or producing television show, whatever it might be, there's a giftedness that allows you to get to the highest level of what you're doing. And I recognize that comes from God and um, I'm grateful. Was there a particular teammate in the course of your career that stood out to you as say the best teammate um, as far as maybe attitude, like what made and what made him? Yeah, you know, um, I've got a great relationship with um, Herb Williams. He and I played together in college. He was really involved in my recruitment along with the other guys. They really sold me on um, how much they wanted to, me to play with them. And then he and I ended up playing a couple years together in the NBA. And he actually broke me into the NBA. He had already been in the NBA with the Pacers for a year. We had spent two years together playing in college. And then I got to the NBA and lived in the same apartment complex with him. He took me to practice, took me to the places to eat, took me to the places we would go out after games. I mean, he really was kind of my mentor and uh, was a great teammate, unselfish, really good player, terrific guy. And uh, I'm extremely grateful for having that type of uh, friend and teammate in college and then to have him be the guy who helped me navigate my first year or two in the NBA because he showed me a great example. And we still are, even though we don't talk a lot, we've still got a real closeness that's born of that um, of that relationship. And I think what made him, he was a smart player. I mean, he was so smart, uh, underratedly so, because he was quiet. People didn't often know how to take her, but I got to know. He was, just, he was, he was probably one of the smartest basketball teammates I've ever had because he understood not just his position, but everybody else's. And then he spent time as a really a player coach with Patrick Ewing and the Knicks during Knicks, during Patrick's heyday. He was a tremendous mentor and then ended up having some opportunity to coach with the Knicks um, as an assistant for a number of years and has coached in the WNBA, but had a great mind for the game and a tremendous disposition in terms of um, serving, caring, listening, understanding. So. He was, um, he's probably, he, he goes to the top of my list probably as, um, as, as my top teammate. Yeah, yeah. You suffered a knee injury early yep. in your career. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk to the guys that may be out there going through difficult times on the mindset you should have just overcoming, yeah. accepting, life, accepting what life gives you yeah. and moving forward with it? Yeah, man, I tell you, it was hard. It was really hard because I was just starting to ascend as a player. I came into the NBA at 21 was one of the youngest guys in the league my rookie year. And then I retired at 26 because of three knee surgeries on my left knee. And my first one, I recovered from pretty fully. The second and third were really the beginning of the end. Um, fortunately, I had come to a place in my life through that injury, through some other circumstances to where I had yielded my heart and my life to Christ in November of 86. It was August of 87 when I had to announce my retirement. So there was an eight, nine month period there where I started to grow in faith and really giving my heart and life to God and trusting him with my future. So that was really the anchor that allowed me to move forward as painful as it was. I mean, basketball had been my life. It really had been on the throne of my life, which is where it shouldn't have been, but it was there and it moved me forward. But then when it was taken away, it really jarred me and that, along with some other circumstances, caused me to think about the bigger picture, the broader picture. And I had great people in my life. Pastors came alongside me at that time. Um, and I had some family that were really, my wife was, 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 a, was a gem in that time. It was painful for both of us. Um, but when you deal with adversity, one, you have to recognize that it's coming. Adversity is coming to all of us. Nobody is immune. Black, white, rich, poor, rural, suburban, um, wherever. You're going to have adversity and it's going to come in different forms. The loss of a loved one, an injury that keeps you from playing, a teacher that doesn't care for you. Make, any number of things you're going to have. Obstacles are part of, of living life and how you, you have control over how you're going to respond and react. You don't always have control over what happens to you. Matter of fact, the only things I think we can control really are our attitude, our effort, and our faith. Mm -hmm. The other things in life we can't control. We can't control other people. We can't control what other people say or think about us. We can control our attitude, how we see ourselves. And I see myself the way God sees me. That's how I try to view myself. That I'm in and made in his image to reflect his glory and goodness in the earth and to um, bring lasting good to other people through my life. So I see that's my worldview and it's based on what the Bible says about me. And then my effort is my work rate. 
How hard am I willing to get work in what I've been given to do? And that's something we can control. You might have physical limitations, but we can control our attitude and effort. And then faith, it's a gift. Faith is a gift. God gives it to us and gives it to all of us. We have to receive it, though. And I've received that gift of faith through um, Jesus Christ. And that really is the foundation. So when you talk about dealing with obstacles or adversity, I think it starts from a framework of, of who are you? Who do you want to be? And recognizing that adversity is part of your journey. And it's, it's there to, to help shape you and move you forward, even when it's painful and really hard. I think team focus played a big role teaching us that. Um, yeah. it, it was when we were younger, we were instilled Rocky and Coach Mike and yeah. Pastor Ray Dempsey. These guys would always teach us to really the only, ha only handicap in this world is a bad attitude. Mm. And you're going to fall in life. Don't worry about the fall. Fall forward. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good teaching there. That'll preach and hunt all day long that there boy and that's real but you've got to embrace that and step into it and that's where the effort comes in yeah because in life it was i think when life got difficult for me i most definitely referenced that and i said hey no matter what life throws at me i'm going to fall forward at least i know i'm a little bit ahead of where i started you know so i, I completely understand that I hope that you're really enjoying this interview as much as I am. I mean, how about this guy? I mean, he's laid back, he's down to earth, and he's just real. But we're not done yet. Tune in later this week for the second part of this interview with Clark Kellogg. During part two, he's gonna dive into what he calls his Kellogg House Rules. Now take a moment to subscribe, hit that like button, and share this with somebody you may know. We hope that you have a wonderful day. And like always, remember, God has a plan for your life.